Michael, speak loudly. I think that we are missing a point here because uh, most of times uh, the reality is that those resources are better being used by those who are stronger than those who are living on top of the resources. Some of those who are resource dependent. <coughs> sorry, what am I supposed to do? Face. Right oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you got to edit that bit out. Um, yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Carry <laughs> for, for example, if we look at the biodiversity resource, let's say plants or, um, or animals, you realize that uh, the issue of poaching or harvesting the, the resources from the wild is it's being driven by an external force which is usually very far from the community. So basically what I'm trying to say that those who be pushing uh, the depletion of their resources may be very far off from those who are close to the resources that are increasing in population. Okay. That is, that is my observation. Okay. So what, oops, um, what belies this argument is um, where are those resources coming from, right? That's a pretty important one. The amount of consumption changes. The cornucopian idea behind this is that people will innovate. They will do more with smaller resources, right? The Green Revolution was emblematic of that, right? So. In anticipation of a bulging population, we made significant investment in hybrid varieties and GMOs and so on, such that we could grow as much, more than twice as much, on a similar parcel of land. Right? Innovation takes over, is what the counter-argument to this is. Right? And so, it's often, it's when we think, again, let's come back to tourism, because tourism, again, as being this centerpiece for conservation, um, you know, we can choose to broaden our horizons and sort of say, well, tourists are not consuming. What about the thousands of tons of carbon, carbon dioxide emissions that are emitted from tourism? People coming on long flights. How do you compare those per capita emissions for an average Ethiopian? Who's consuming? Where are those resources coming from? Right? I think that from a particular perspective, we have to look at what consumption means and to whom in respect to the resource scarcity argument. Now, here, let's look at a couple of graphs on population, right? This is uh, from uh, two population estimates from the UN. One is sort of saying that we'll continue to grow. The other from uh, a population estimate from Deutsche Bank, which is sort of saying we're going to peak around 2050 and then we're going to start declining. Um, this is from the United Nations Development Program. It shows you a range of different scenarios as to how population is going to be considered. One is a leveling off, one is a slight increase, one is a higher increase. Right? But this, and when you look at this in terms of, of what's happening with the growth rates, you have changing growth rates going on. Again, putting this within the context of how do you plan for conservation, how do you make in conservation work in 50 years time? Are you going to have the same demographics when it comes to that sort of conservation plan? Right? Now, these are global estimates and then individual uh, uh, country estimates. But what, are we, what conservation threats might we plan for in 2050? Is population going to be the same problem as it is right now? What about if the state aggressively pursues family planning strategies? Right? These are, again, we have to, I think we are so, well, our minds are so well trained to think about current problems with current solutions. But we're not thinking about the long term. And that means we have to think more outside the box. And I wanted to show you examples from, um, from these population pyramids of Ethiopia, which will actually show you projecting out to the next 100 years how the population structure is likely to change based on existing models, right? 
And I, I showed this population, this link there, and feel free to go to it and click on your individual countries and animate this so that you can look at it 50 years out, 100 years out, and actually see what the population growth rates are. And apply, you can fairly easily apply the same modeling techniques to local level data, to country level data, to sub, sub county national uh, uh, level data to actually see what these predictions might be. So this going back to uh, resource scarcity arguments, um, I'm happy to provide uh, some, some resources available on this. When we talk about increasing population growth rate, rates, it's, it's very clearly established in the literature that when you increase women's empowerment, women's rights, women's education and literature, literacy rates, your fertility li rates will drop. And you see this clearly in the case of, of Kerala in India. As soon as you have a, a higher female literacy rate, you see the national fertility rate dropping significantly. So again, going back to those two points, conservation policy, con uh, policy, yeah. Are you talking fertility rate as in birth rate or actual fertility? So fertility oh, rates. Sorry, I don't make a stupid question. But. So fertility rates are, is not necessarily tied to birth rates. I'm totally blanking on what the <laughs> definition is right now. Um, I, I believe, because I don't want to give you false information, I believe that fertility rate is the average number of children per woman of between the ages of 18 and 45, I think. So you're talking fitness? Yeah. Okay, fertility rate is the num average number of children a person can possibly have. Possibly have, yeah. But, but, uh, but these are the number of births. The, number. the more you get education, the less time you spend on raising children. Within the age range of yes. like 18 to 45, yeah. yeah. So, so here is a, you know, again, we think about, you know, biodiverse, uh, biodiversity conservation as a policy realm, realm and, um, and poverty eradication as a separate realm, right? If one of the drivers of, of poverty is, is that people are having too many children and, and are not able to gather enough income to support those people, invest in, edu in women's education, <coughs> right? But that's not a conservation priority. That's the point I'm trying to make here. And this is where it becomes particularly tricky at the national level. Because the moment the Ministry of Tourism and Wildlife starts talking about family planning, Another ministry will be like, hey, hang on a second here. We've been doing this work for, you know, decades, right? Anyway, so those are some of the political and social aspects. I'm just, like I said, I'm not going to talk too much about the ecological aspects, but I thought one of the ones that would be really cool is to look at the predicted uh, climate change for Ethiopia. And this is, this is a fairly common graph that you will see if you're looking at climate change scenarios. And these are the different emission scenarios that I asked Lee about. And it's basically like, this is on a higher end if the world does agree to particular cuts, uh, does not agree to particular cuts, and then if it does agree to particular cuts. And you can see now the anomaly, the anomaly is based on the mean annual temperature from 1970 to 1995. That's the baseline. And these would be considered anomalies from that. And you can see the, the, the region of uncertainty or the standard deviations associated with this. So overall, expected temperature going up to 2100 for Ethiopia is increasing. Okay? This is what the climate scientists will give you. What does this actually mean? Anyone want to take, take us? This is what the climate change scientists will give you. You are the conservation planner. We're talking about long-term integrity. How do you use this information? in how they might respond to warming, okay? So say we go from an anomaly of, looks like, you know, this is on the cooler, this is the, this is the historical data, this is where the, the new data starts, these are the predictions. 
you, a lot of you guys were really interested in the climate change aspect. But this is what a climate change modeler will give you. So you as a conservation planner, how do you make sense of this? Yeah. I think <coughs> she said one, that will also help us to look at our individual species. Another thing is, it's, it's, an, it's a tool you can use for education because you know the causes of emissions. And one major one is deforestation. So if you are having any conservation education program for maybe the locals and on a national level, you can also use some of this information, some of this information to educate people that this okay. is what will happen if we increase, if we don't cut down our emission. Maybe. Okay. Yeah. Lee. So, kind of a, a counter argument to that, then, or or maybe just an, a frustration with climate change is, you know, let's say we're talking about pollution of a river. You can say to local or regional inhabitants or authorities, behave better and your river will be more healthy, right? But with climate change, it, you know, we could say that to the, the people in Rira, you know, don't cut the forest, don't do this, don't do this, do this, do this. And they could behave perfectly. 